It's big. The Amazon is very big, and actually my experience is only a small part of it. But to give you an idea of the size of the Amazon, let me just make some visual comparisons. And there it is in comparison with the continental U.S. And so uh, imagine you had somebody tell you about the U.S. or talk to Australia or others and say, well, I'm going to tell you all in 20 minutes about what's going on. And you say, hmm, maybe it's a little bit more complicated than that. And so I'm going to be concentrating down in a corner, uh, in the southwest corner, and which probably has many of the elements that are affecting other areas. And so this southwest corner, we call it the Madre de Dios from Peru, Acre from Brazil, and Pando from Bolivia, the map region. It's a tri-national area. And it gives you an idea of how it compares to the Northeast. It isn't Nevada, but still, these are pretty big, uh, relatively big uh, states. And here it looks in a different way. Um, some of the names I put on here that I'll be presenting just to, to uh, orient you, there's Inyapari which, and Cobia and Brasilea, which are all on the same river that goes to Rio Branco. You'll see Puerto Maldonado appearing. That's the capital of Madre de Deus. And you'll also see over in the corner, Beni, uh, which, and all that flows into the Madeira River. And I just give you that as a little feeling um, for geography is what we'll be addressing. So let's look at 10 years, and it's been a very an exciting 10 years. I think there's a Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. And we've had a very interesting time for the last 10 years. We've had severe droughts and forest fires in 2005 and 2010. Flooding, and a way of measuring it is if a city declares a state of emergency, and we've done it for the last seven years in the capital. Uh, we've had flooding the Madeira River uh, last year, which reduced truck traffic by 90% over two months, something I never thought possible. Imagine you live in a city and you don't have trucks coming in for two months. What that, what that implies in terms of the functioning of both an urban and a regional environment. And we've had a heat wave. Uh, in the last uh, three, three months, we've had a third of the time of temperatures, peak temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius, which is 95 degrees. This is not common. And in the memory of other people, they have not found this to be the case. So let's look at it in a little more detail. And you see we're out in southwestern. We're blessed with being the epicenter of two major droughts uh, that occurred. And if you use what is called the, the stationarity uh, paradigm, the probability of these droughts is about once per century, or one percent a year. And to have two of them within five years, or six years, was, was uh, a big surprise. The first one in 2005 caused a change. Normally, rainforests are barriers to fires. People cut down their area, let it dry, uh, set fire, and the fire burns, releases nutrients, penetrates a little bit into the forest and stops there. But in 2005, the drought continued to the extent that uh, the forest turned into kindling. In other words, once the fire got in, it was self-propagating and would continue to, to march. And in the state of Acre, it was more than 3,000 square kilometers of old growth rainforest that got affected. Pando, more than 1,000. Madre de Deus, more than 200. And that's not, uh, there's also an equal area or more so in pastures, uh, agricultural lands, and agroforestry systems that also burned. Big stuff. This is uh, an example, and it's, um, that's me. I'm not very intelligent. Sometimes I do things that I shouldn't do. So I wanted to get close to it, and when I got close to it, I, the heat was so intense that I had to turn to shield my face. And so it may seem to be a very low fire, but it's having an effect, and it's also changing the whole regeneration process. And this is what it looks like uh, from a plane. I was um, involved in a lot of overflights to try to identify, helping the, the firemen and other officials try to fight the fires. And we didn't fight the fires. Um, if you look, this was a picture that I took. Uh, I could identify where it was, 
But think about going into a rainforest, which has no trails in a given area, and you're carrying on your back maybe 60 pounds of water pack, but you also have machete and everything else, and, you're, and you don't know where you really are, and you're not sure where the fire is. So how do you fight a fire? And so we had, that was what was happening uh, in our area, and this is what happened. The fire was ground fires, but as they rose up, they would affect the vegetation. And so this is the, the difference in color, and that would show up uh, on satellite imagery. So here is in Chapuri, which is between Brasile and, and Rio Branco. And before the fires uh, were propagating, you'd have, you see those dark purple areas? Those were cleared areas, cut, burned, and after the fire went into the forest and stopped. So up to the 21st of August, uh, you didn't have propagation. You did have it in pasture areas. You can see paddocks there that have burned. But between August and September, the, the nonlinear response occurred, which means that the forest stopped being a barrier, and then you set a fire, and 10 kilometers later, it would proceed. And so this is what was the, the pattern. And this was the, the impact uh, that we had in that area. And if you were to look all around, 300,000 hectares is also 3,000 square kilometers, and it was all over the place. And what put it out was, was God and, and the rainfall, basically. We have had, um, uh, I almost entitled this, uh, Preparing for the Perfect Storm. In 1926, 25, 26, we had a drought that lasted seven months, associated with a big El Nino event. And if we had had that same drought for that time period, we would have had much more than 300,000 hectares affected. And that is something which I use when I talk with climate skeptics. And I often have to say, said, OK, you don't believe the climate is changing. Just think about repeating an event that occurred in the past. And with our current distribution of people in the forest or burning, we would have, we have ignition points throughout this part of the Amazon. We would lose a lot. And so it's a way of talking with people um, to get them ready for some of the challenges that we're facing. And what seems so strange, there's a lot of things, the paradigm issue I think is really important to realize how we have to revise them. I figured, well, when a forest burns, then it's burned. It's not gonna reburn again. And then I learned that these fires can last for weeks and they produce their own fuel because as the the ground fire goes along, raises up, dries the, the foliage that falls down, and you have this situation. At first, I look and say, oh, gee, it didn't burn here. And then I took my machete, cleaned away a little bit of the soil, and you see it. There's ash below that. And there were reports of uh, the rainforest burning three times in a given area. So it's producing its own fuel each time and permitting uh, fire penetration again. Another thing, you can have hot coals that are in the fallen trees, and there it can be a source that can last for weeks. So you can have a process, and there was one case um, I was helping the firemen. They went back four times to a given area. The initial fire was 60 hectares. The final area affected was 1,800 uh, hectares. And each time it had stopped, they controlled it, but they couldn't wipe that out, that type of, or see it, or find it. The dry season continues, uh, wind comes along, or the tree falls over, and you start the process again. Accompanying this is smoke. And in this case, uh, in late September, it was incredible. 25 micrograms per cubic meter is the level recommended by the World Health Organization that shouldn't occur more than um, three times a year. The average value for the month of September in Rio Branco was above 25. And we had days when it was over 500. 
This makes pollution in a major city seem to be small potatoes. And we're in what is in part a pristine area uh, of the Amazon. I think the same process is occurring right now in Indonesia. Um, so lessons from this about uh, period and past droughts for fire cycles in this part of the world. Two to three months without significant rain can allow forest fires to advance in old growth forests. Uh, the report that I'm hearing, we're talking with local producers, rubber tappers, their feeling, their, their sense is that that time is reducing because our temperatures are higher. And the heat wave that we've experienced this year is, like I said, we had a third of the time above uh, 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, this time is becoming shorter, which means it's more probable in the future that we'll have this, these types of problems. And repeating the story about the 1925-26 drought, uh, we repeat that, we're going to have a real problem. So we're faced with changing human behavior because we're having problems changing the climate, although that's one of the topics I wanted to talk about here. But what we can do on a local basis is work on human behavior and reducing uh, the points of ignition. <clears throat> well, the other side of this cycle is also water, and we have flooding. This is the major interstate highway uh, heading in to, uh, that connects Acre State and uh, other areas with southern Brazil. And this is what happened uh, in the flooding. Well, so Rio Branco, on a local basis, has flooding every year. The most dramatic was in 2012. I'll be showing some pictures. And then 2000, and everybody says, well, oh, gosh, well, that's a 20-year flood. And then in 2015, we had it worse. And now people, the discourse is, oh, my gosh, what's coming next? So this is uh, one of the headwaters areas in Yapari, Peru, uh, the mayor's office, uh, going downstream to Cobia, the capital of Pando. This is uh, the naval uh, <clears throat> headquarters of the Bolivian Navy. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll go into details on that. Okay, um, Rio Branco and its flooding. And when the water goes down, you see the bigger impacts. And this is in Portuguese, but it's basically saying that the Senator George Viana said that Acre faces worst natural disaster in its history. And it was 2012 when he said that. And then he said the same thing in 2015. And so we're getting a paradigm shift also between building, the idea is building, development advances, and now rebuilding, recovery, the idea that things go down and don't always uh, go up continually. Um, it's kind of obvious that's a second story, right? That that's a second floor, okay. Okay, just so to give you an idea of the flooding that happened in 2015. Uh, the mayor, got a great guy, he's very good, said in 2013, we haven't recovered from last year's flooding and now we have another. And then he said after this last flood, it'll take five years to recover, but we're getting floods every year. So this is the reality, I'm trying to give you a reality of what is happening in this part of the world. 2014, we had something that came out of the blue. Nobody predicted it, and it started, occurred outside of our region. And it started um, in February with the flooding in Puerto Maldonado, which was the worst in 50 years. And then <clears throat> in the Beni, which is a big, flat region, it flooded, and they lost, uh, estimates went up to 500,000 head of cattle, just to give you an idea. Um, this gives you another the view from the cow's perspective. Uh, <clears throat> and this is not the ocean. That little dot up there is a forested hill, okay? So the, and that water had to go someplace. And so it went down uh, into the Madeira River. And those are the trucks trying to get to Acre um, with supplies. And uh, the firemen had a new task, which they never thought would be coming truck drivers, and getting them through the truck, the supplies through critical areas. 
And things get serious when you have to ration beans in, in a Latin American country, and we got to that stage. We have a lot of things going on related to climate already and more on the way. There's dams proliferating with about 150 planned. We have several big ones that are already in there, particularly on the Madeira River in Rondonia. Uh, this is looking at climate models. And the idea is when does you, uh, an annual temperature, for example, you go, you leave your, let's say, the range of recent variability. And so you look at all the models and then you spatialize it, which means you look at it at various places in the world. This is the, the same group of the two degree temperature on the average, but looking at, at individual points. And the conclusion of this uh, paper was that unprecedented climates will occur earliest in the tropics and among low-income countries. Well, for Rio Branco, the departure date is, on the world, it's around 2050. For the map region, it's in the next five to 10 years. And when having gone through a uh, heat wave, it's given a taste of what uh, may come. So um, we're becoming an epicenter for climate change and impacts. And another way of looking at it is we're the canary in the Amazonian climate mine. Um, this is an abstract submitted to an AGU session on extreme events in Amazonia, how to adapt and mitigate that will occur, oops, in December uh, 2015, San Francisco. And this is the vice governor, and she wanted to speak to scientists. And her message was the following. For the last 17 years, successive state administrations have been implementing a socio-environmental model of development that strives to link sustainable economic production with environmental conservation, particularly for small communities. In this context, extreme climate events have interfered significantly with the model, increasing the risks of failure. So let me just take a sidestep for that uplifting part of the presentation, get everybody happy into philosophy and framing. I'm a problemologist for the most part. Uh, that's my training, and uh, is trying to define the problems. But what society needs, I think we all need, is solutions. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here uh, listening so avidly to the, to the speakers. Um, still, I do want to say it's important how you define the problems because it affects how you look for solutions. Paradigm has become a word that we're using a lot. I just decided to put it up there in terms of the definition. It's a model. And this is a way of looking at <laughs> Another way of looking at it. And it's helped me because, think about it, for that chick, the world has changed. But the world didn't change. It was the vision of the chick that changed. And I think that's the thing to think about on our paradigm shifts. The world is out there. How we look at it can make a big difference. So what are the paradigms that need changing? What are the enduring paradigms? And as we've been pointing out, central to this conference, restoration of small water cycles is a paradigm shift. I am a scientist, and scientists argue all the time. I, it, for those of you who have not had a lot of contact with scientists, you think, oh, your science is a textbook, and you read the textbook, and you've got it. No, but you get into the science, everybody argues. Like, well, I, that point, you know, I want to talk about that point. And so, um, Huh? <laughs> yeah. So I, I thought of a, uh, a phrase attributed to G. G. Hutchinson by a friend of mine, Tom Lovejoy. He says, what's right about this paper? What's, what are the key things that are, are important? Make it for us. And what can we apply to the Amazon? So I did want to try. And boy, now I'm going to see if I can do this or not. Yeah. OK. Just to give you an idea, and this is a little bit of what the circulation pattern is in the Amazon because it leads into some of the other things we're talking about. And you can see there's sort of a general drifting from the ocean inwards, and then it takes a turn and heads down. Where it takes a turn and heads down is where is the map region. Um, okay. And for those of you who are interested, uh, I'm a, I can't get away with being a scientist. That's one of my problems. So I put a lot of references in this. 
please feel free to copy this, use it, and go after these, uh, the, these references for additional information. But this shows sort of the general pattern, and it was published in the Journal of Climate, which is sort of the, about as mainstream as you can get in the climate literature, and which I found uh, exciting, that they would put in something on aerial rivers and lakes into the, uh, into the general publication. Also, I've been talking with a lot of you. Several requests have come in to address certain issues. It's going to be a little bit disjointed, because, but I do want to put in some references. If you want to get into the biotic pump story, this is a real interesting article. Not that I understand the article, but it's a real interesting <laughs> article. And what's m very interesting, for those of you who have engaged in the publication process in science, they submitted in 2010. It was published in 2013. It took three years. Uh, and the end of the paper, there is an editor's comment. That is very rare. You, ed editors don't put their comments on papers. But they did here, and I, just to give you a, a, a brief uh, taste of it, the authors have presented an entirely new view of what may be driving dynamics in the atmosphere. This new theory has been subject to considerable criticism. Dot, dot, dot. The handling editor and the executive committee concluded to allow final publication of the manuscript in atmospheric uh, chemistry and physics in order to facilitate further development of the presented arguments, which may lead to disproof or validation by the scientific community. So if you and just, there's a, there's a link. You want to go in there, and you can get the philosophy of science, the peer review process, and everything. It's fascinating. But going back to what I was showing you before, this is the general pattern of water comes, evaporates from the um, Atlantic Ocean, comes this way, and then goes, either returns in the rivers or heads down to southern uh, South America. In the case of Brazil in 2014, you saw that water. That was water destined to go to Sao Paulo. Okay, it didn't disappear. We got it, and it went back directly. There was a blockage of the uh, transportation process, which has exacerbated the drought in that area. Okay, the basic argument is that pastures have lower transpiration than forests during the dry season. And another mainline, mainstream science article in 2008 pointed out that if things go by 2050, we'll have large-scale deforestation in the Amazon. And if we use the laws, it'll be less. And basically pointed out something which I found very interesting, the ecosystem service of transpiration. And thinking of transpiration as something uh, extremely important, came out in a science article, mainstream science, but has not been incorporated in a Brazilian public policy. Uh, is this already occurring? And the argument is as follows. Where hit, when you hit uh, that area, you get fat, more runoff, and you get less transpiration. If that's the case, then you would expect increased flow in rivers that have been deforested. This is a little bit different than a paradigm that many of you have, have put out there. But it's basically faster runoff when it rains, less transpiration when in the dry season. So therefore, more base flow. And that is what has been observed uh, for due decades from the Araguaia River. There's also another paradigm shift for Amazonia, where the loss of forest equals loss of rainfall. And the loss of rainfall it translates into loss of cultural, agricultural productivity. The, one of the, the false debates, well, this, well, no, it's not a false debate, it's a true debate on one hand. Or the Amazon, you preserve it, or you feed the, the growing billions that we need. Think of it that way. This is the framing of the, the story. This is a reframing. This is saying, you cut down the Amazon, you're not going to get the agricultural productivity that you think you're going to get because rainfall will drop. So it changes the framing immensely. This will probably take another 10 years to get into Brazilian public policy, just to 
give you an idea. Other things are also changing. I just put these articles up so that you see them about the intensification of the global water cycle, range between dry and wet season precipitation, intensification of the hydraulic uh, cycle in the Amazon, recent extreme events, adaptation. Current state of knowledge, don't deforest or you lose water in the Amazon. Message is seeping in slowly to policymakers and the public. The biotic pump will take more time. Recent published estimates of deforested area in the Amazon. This is sort of the, the inverse of, let's say, developed countries, okay? Six million square kilometers. The loss has been about 13%. So it's accelerating, but we still have a lot of forest cover. So there's a focus on conserving it because it's a lot easier not to cut down a forest than to try to replant a forest, okay? So is there a place for restoration in the Amazon? Yes, okay, because when you do the, the math, the 13% comes out to an area the size of California and Montana, and it's increasing every year. And so just an example from Eastern Acre, where I'm from, if you could zoom in on that area, in near Rio Branco, there's this area the size of Connecticut that's deforested, close to where I live. These are areas where the small water cycle paradigm could be put to use. Uh, another thing, uh, point I wanted to make is uh, everything should be made as simple as possible and not simpler. And it was attributed to uh, the, the phrase is below there, but it was a simplified saying. Okay? And when people say holistic, I say, uh oh, this is going to get complicated because holistic means complex. You're putting in all the parts, and you have to think about all the parts. And it's, uh, so for climate change, there's no silver bullet. Just pointing out, my basic background is in oceanography. Don't forget the oceans, please. And this is the Pacific, this is what the Earth looks like over the southwestern uh, Pacific Ocean. You don't see land. And the reason that you don't see land is because 70% of the Earth is covered by water. So if we're talking about rehydration, don't worry about this part. <laughs> the other parts, there's Antarctica, Greenland, forests, and so on. So there's less than 16% of the Earth's cover is in sub cropland, savanna, shrublands where hydration of landscapes are possible. So it's a small percentage, but it is extremely important percentage. That's where we live. <laughs> Think about it. Take that 15% in the middle of the ocean, doesn't matter. I mean, who lives in the middle of the ocean if they're not an island? But where the hydration of landscapes is occurring is where we live and where it makes an uh, important difference. Okay, going back to sea level live, I, I went, uh, Michael, you, you got me stimulated, and so I looked up a reference, and there's a lot going on. And one of the things is uh, that I got out of this paper uh, from Nature uh, was that there's 42% of the observed sea level rise is coming from terrestrial uh, water sources. Now, this is a model. In the same way, they may not be incorporating all the things that Michael's putting in or vice versa. And one of the things they came up was a the unsustainable uh, of groundwater represents the largest contribution. And this is a, an issue I just wanted to pass on. Okay, so who is doing holistic thinking at a global scale? And we could bring together the links of the change, em emissionaries, is that the word, Adam? Yeah, yeah okay. No, it should be emissionaries. Emissionaries, okay. Water cyclists, etc. And so we thought about, uh, a former bouncer might have some suggestions as <laughs> what could be done, okay? And there he is. Uh, and the first paragraph starts out, our mother earth, our sister. And I said, oh, this is gonna be an interesting document. And then the third paragraph, now faced with we are with global environment deterioration, I'd like to address every person living on this planet in the encyclical, I would like to enter a dialogue with all the people about the common home. I'm not Catholic, but I thought I was included in his statement. Okay, 
And so I interpret what he's saying is we need to join the links. And I urgently appeal for a new dialogue that in, about how we are shaping the future of our planet. We need a conversation that includes everyone since environmental challenge we are undergoing and its human roots concern and affect us all. Regrettably, many efforts to seek concrete solutions to the environmental crisis have proven ineffective, not only because of powerful opposition, but also because of a more general lack of interest. We require a new and universal solidarity. All of us can cooperate as instruments of God for the care of creation, each according to his or her own culture, experience, involvements, and talents. So I did want to do a little, after yesterday's um, uh, presentation, I wanted to show uh, if I could get some volunteers. And those who don't want to volunteer can step back. Okay? No, I'm for but can I are involved, important, great, doing great things. Who is the most important? <laughs> <laughs> Who is going to make the difference? The missing people are the most important. This chain is big, and there's several ones. But we've got to think also not only about what we have, but what we need to bring together. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm just finishing. I'll just finish off now. So think about what groups are not here. What are those who are? You know, I did a, a real quick analysis. I, you know, we have 50 people here. The number of people with, if not blonde or something similar, is about 25. So 50% of this group has got gray hairs, OK? So I mean, we can look at how do we bring in other groups uh, to address these issues. Um, in conclusion, the Amazon is big, diverse, growing extremely, with growing extreme climate events. It's both an area of preservation, restoration stages, paradigm shifts occurring, uh, changing the framing of problem solutions. Water is better than carbon, I'll say that. In, in, uh, everybody wants water. Everybody understands the importance of water to mobilize local and regional efforts to address climate change. <coughs> Small water cycle paradigm is critical, but can create expectations of a silver bullet. It is part of a bigger effort. We need to link a lot of people together. Big problems need big ideas for solutions. Laudato Si is an example. We're all together on this journey. Thank you. So we've got a few minutes for Q&A. Go for it. Fill on. I have a couple of questions on my mind. First of all, um, the um, scale of response that's needed in the short time that's available. Um, I'm thinking of Al Gore's Climate Reality Project, which is an international training program. Um, putting it out to the audience, it would be wonderful if something like this could be developed. Um, is there anything of this kind available or beginning as a groundswell? Um, the second question that I have, um, one of my dear friends is Alana Leah, who you, whom you may know. She has a program called I Give Trees. 
and she is working on reforesting areas of the Amazon, working with the indigenous people. They are running into obstruction at the kindest, um, opposition from companies like Monsanto who are looking to reforest with GMO trees. I, if you could comment on that. Uh, <clears throat> that's an excellent question. And I tell my students, when you don't know the answer, start off with it's an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> but I will speculate a little bit. In our part of the Amazon, we don't, we don't, people are talking planting trees, probably eucalyptus. So it's mainly bringing in Australia to, uh, to parts of the, uh, there's, a, there's, <laughs> you want more fire? Yeah, that's, what, <laughs> that's one of the issues. Um, so I can't really speak in terms of personal experience. I think that's probably in Pará state or in, in, the, in, the, in the eastern area. Um, in terms of educational efforts, disasters are wonderful educational devices. I mean, it's the two by four means of learning. I don't know if you know the, the story about a donkey. You want to teach a donkey, you hit him over the head with a two by four to get his attention. Well, we got hit. The, my talk was a two by four talk. You know, this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. And you saw the statement of one of our leading policy persons, the vice governor. We are really concerned that the model, this nice model I've been working on to try to get communities involved, uh, could get washed away, literally. One of the, the prime topics was reforesting of the, um, of the margins of the Acre River. Well, the last flood, 80% uh, of those efforts were washed away. So uh, I will tell you about my fears. Um, and the fear is what is called a situ situationally rational response. Imagine you are a small producer, um, and you've, jet you've planted uh, coffee. It's sort of a simple agroforestry system. And it's three years. It's been growing, and the bushes are growing, and it's, and it's just about ready, and you've taken a loan out the bank, and you're about ready, to, thinking about paying that off, and fire comes and toasts your whole coffee crop. And your neighbor has had a bunch of cows, and he has grassland, it's degraded and stuff, but he gets by. So your whole investment is toast, uh, three years of work, and you're looking to pay off uh, the bank loan, and your neighbor has got skinny cows. But then three weeks later, there's fresh blades of grass growing up in his pasture. What will you do next year? And I would say in a period of greater uncertainty, the tendency is to go for short cycle solutions. And um, this can perpetuate, uh, it can be a vicious cycle downwards. So that is one of my concerns. And that's why I'm really happy to hear and to get people talking about. The other is the importance of um, uh, non-technical components of solutions. In other words, people. Uh, the community, the social capital, the talents, and so on that you need to bring together. And that's the thing about listening uh, of these stories. The technical side is interesting, but people have to really want to make it happen. And that is, I see, where the educational component can be really important. And getting these stories, these success stories out. Remember the last, I don't know if you were here yesterday, but that last phrase from Henry Ford about the solutions. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. And uh, I'm concerned as a scientist, I am, tend to be rather doom and gloom. And that, it, you know, nobody invites me to parties anymore. <laughs> we invited you. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. So. Uh, 
the probability of getting two questioners sitting next to each other is very low. But uh, this was raised earlier, but you reified it by um, pointing out the problem uh, of the conflict between the feeding the millions, billions out of the Amazon or preserving the rainforest. I come from the middle of the Corn Belt in the United States, which was not all of it naturally a forest. Much of it was grassland. So the contrast is more is less stark, but the resistance to change is even greater because it's a wealthy region with a lot of structural uh, rigidity. What can we do to um, ease the sense of tension and conflict between feeding humanity and converting our agricultural landscapes to carbon sponges? Because the one and a half percent soil carbon in the Corn Belt that we have today is not doing much more than the impervious surfaces of our cities, and it's a much larger area. Maybe that's enough. Um, excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are people here who are more, more qualified to answer that. But uh, let me respond to the, that paper, why I think that paper is so important. Because there's this du duality. I use the framing issue. I try to teach my students the importance of framing. And so I go to them, are you an environmentalist or someone concerned about development? And in a developing country, which do you think would be the answer? Okay, are you one of those environmentalists, or are you someone who is worried about the welfare of people? So how you frame the issue can be extremely important. Are you, want, you want to preserve monkeys, or are you worried about the human rights to have food? Well, that article says it's a false, a false argument. And I think the same way you can reframe the discussion in the Corn Belt in a different way. I'm not sure exactly, but one is, are you part of the solution of improving food security and climate security? Or are you one of those people not worried about the future? Well, it, you, can, you can figure out how you want to frame it. But. OK, we're just about done, but I have a request from one of our most dedicated volunteers for a one-minute statement, so I cannot refuse. <laughs> or I won't work anymore. <laughs> I'm not absolutely positive of this, but I think we should check with Wes Jackson. I think I once heard him say that the small farmers are actually more productive per acre than the big farmers. Okay, we have time for a um, 10 minute or so break. I'd, I'll say we have time for a five minute break because then we'll be back in 15 minutes. <laughs> and we have our final panel. So see you all soon. Thank you.